Welcome back everybody to uh, Reynolds Runabouts. This is Jeffrey Reynolds. This week I worked on the fairing and fixing of the hull and deck joint called the shear line in many cases. Um, years ago it was done uh, when I was a lot less experienced and with today's chemicals uh, and compounds I can do a much better job. And so that's what I spent my time doing. These are some of the areas that I have to address. Um, you can see that there's a, you know, an area between the, the deck. This is the new plywood mahogany. This is the original deck. This deck was gone, so I replaced it. But as I found out, this deck originally, they took the fiberglass and wrapped it on the deck. And I cut that joint when I took the boat apart and found out that this clamp where the deck sits on and where the um, frames tie into is very uneven. And you can see some of the old Bondo that I used, or not Bondo, but fairing compound, and where it gets right down to the original glass. So I have to go through the entire shear line and fix that in addition to some areas that were um, not correct. Some of them um, were so rich with polyester uh, resin that the glass was hardly there. So when I did this fairing lately, um, it went right through. So what I'll end up doing is cut this all out with an oscillating tool because it's bad. And you can see that there's a backer of glass that I put in there when I was rebuilding the boat to uh, shore up the shear clamp and so I have a nice place to put uh, new glass and resin epoxy to fill that and then I'll fair it smooth when we do the the final fairing the original bull nose very Chris crafty from the 50s this originally was empty and I rebuilt it with glass and resin to get that shape again but I have some areas where I need to go back and even correct some of my own work. But again, here on the port side, I've got some areas that I sanded through, mostly because it was too rich with resin and not enough glass. Other areas are just uneven. That will go quite quickly. I've got some areas where the 5200 compound that I used to attach the deck uh, is squeezed out, so I'll have to dig that out with a Dremel because the fairing compound won't stick to that. And then, yeah, just fill in areas like this, take 5200 out, fair it in, and then the rub rail trim will go right over the top of that. And so I end up, I'm going to take the, the black all the way up to the corner of the deck, and that'll be covered with um, the rub rail. So it should tie in quite nicely. So to finish taking out the glass, which here's a piece of it, it's very brittle. It's the original um, polyester or vinyl ester resin and glass mixture from 1957. Um, and with polyester and vinyl ester, there's a tendency if you aren't careful um, that you can put too much of that resin into glass mixture and get a brittle, um, it almost looks like amber hardened honey. I've got a lot of that along here that I'll probably end up uh, going after because I'm going to want something really strong. Um, it might look okay, but it's very brittle if you just hit it just the right way. Um, so you want to put in the more modern, stronger epoxy uh, resin so that that won't happen. And you know, this is an old boat. Glass does get old. It gets brittle. Uh, this is probably the, the the area that will would probably have the most issues with stress, abuse, and maybe some over resin. Because he was wrapping the glass over on top of the deck, Clyde probably made sure that that was really well filled with resin and to, you know to make glue. That might have been what he was doing. I'm not sure, um, but you can see that it's quite quite hollow in here. This is my 
the shear clamp inside the plywood that I created to straighten up that joint in many areas and to hold the frames which are under the boat uh, deck. Um, so they're serving their purpose. This is quite strong. It's just now we have an issue of water and obviously cosmetic. Then I'll go in there and I'll refill this with small strands of uh, chopped glass and resin and just build it up, build it up, build it up. And I might even go inside and see what sort of light is showing through and maybe doing some patching from the inside. I'm not sure. I think that that joint, the deck to my new share is, is full of 5200, so I think it's fine. Um, but the majority of it will all take place out here. And it's just a slow, methodical, resin and chopped uh, strand fiberglass, just pushing it into place and getting it layer after layer after layer um, until you get it smooth. And then I'll leave a little bit for the fairing compound to fill that, and I'll take it right up to the bottom of our new deck. And this will be nice and fair and safe and waterproof. A perfect tool for the less invasive cutting that I'll be doing and sanding is what's called the Dremel Trio. Um, you probably remember the Dremels that were the, you know, the single straight handhold. This is the Trio, which not only can you use like the original, it's a lot more ergonomic or you know, ergonomically more comfortable, but it also has like a saber saw attachment that allows you to put it on a flat surface and then you could, you could work on sanding a hole. Um, if I had a, a more steady problem here, I could put that foot on here and then steadily do that. But because I have kind of a hodgepodge, I'll do, I took the stand off and you can just freehand it. I mean, it's very quiet. Um, of course, you're gonna wanna use a mask and eye protection. Um, it also comes with different size barrel sanders, but also it has um, router bits, if you want to call them, that are small you know, and controllable versus a router. Because uh, this is a good router application if it was safe, but it, you, there's a chances of ruining the boat or the deck or quite high. This is the second best thing. You don't have to worry about cutting. It's all about sanding or routing, but in a very controlled fashion. So this is what I'll be doing the majority of my work with. Um, in the in going around this whole shear and other places on the boat where I find spider cracks and things like in the bow, I'll be doing that. Because this sander does not have any sort of dust collection, um, even though I'm wearing a mask and glasses, um, I'm using my you know, tried technique of your vacuum next to your head of your sander, which I used. I haven't shown you that, but I use it quite a bit when I'm doing fiberglass work. I put the nozzle right down by the um, the tip of the thin Makita belt sander I use. You can do the same concept with this. It really, it'll spin, unfortunately, left, which, um, you know, if you're right-handed. So it spins really well into the, the flow of the vacuum and it takes almost all of the dust out of the air that is gonna flood your area. And uh, with the mask and the hose, it's a very effective uh, way to sand and I'm just getting right down into these grooves and it's a really nice angle, kind of dishing it out so that when my fairing compound goes in there having a lot of grip under that deck and it'll be a nice fair finish.
you can see I've got a lot of spider cracks in this nose. And this, you know, this is the one I did years ago. And a lot of it has to do with just too much resin and not enough glass. So I'm gonna have to really work on that. I'm really happy down in here. It's not too bad, but I can see cracks. So probably we'll take my orbital or even a hand sander and open all that paint up and see what's underneath. Because if it's doing it here on the paint, it's doing it in the glass. So this nose that I rebuilt years ago, uh, I, took a, I took a shape of it um, and then I went ahead and rebuilt it out of fiberglass and I thought enough fiberglass and resin, but obviously not. So I'm gonna end up redoing this nose. Um, the rest of the boat doesn't look too bad, but I know this one's got a lot of work. So I'll be using my Dremel Trio a lot. So I got my Dremel out and started working just the, the cracks. And while I was able to get into most of them, clean them out up here, which I knew was resin rich. This is just me and youth, lack of experience. Um, I thought there was more glass in there than there is. So like in 2002, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna just sand this down until I get to um, solid boat. Like I told you, there's a, there's a void in here that was there when they took it out of the mold. And I'm not sure if it was something that happened by accident or they just built it up after the fact. Um, so what I'll end up doing is just taking my palm sander to this until I find some real fiberglass. Before I do that, I'm gonna use a contour uh, tool and that will allow me, and I did this back in 2002, I did this as well. And I took the contour of this nose before I worked on it and I just took it and I made a paper pattern that I eventually would use to, when I was fairing this, I had a place to start. Um, so these are really handy tools. This is a nice big one by Saker. Um, and I'm gonna use it to recreate this after I essentially destroy it. So onward. So using a variety of tools, starting with sander, um, and I got out my oscillating um, half moon blade. I started chasing the cracks and the cracks went all the way down into the original um, woven roving, which is a strength layer for a glass boat. Here is what they call cloth. This would be on the outside against the gel coat. And then usually under the cloth, you'll find uh, woven roving, which is a, it's a very thick, high resin absorbing type of fiberglass, which is probably why we have so much resin when we don't need it. And I think it was just filled uh, originally, just a lot of glass was put into this nose. As you can see, this nose is not, wasn't molded to its final shape. It was, um, in fact, I think it's even more hollow under here, but I'm afraid to go any farther. This right here is an inner layer of um, cloth that I put down um, on the inside of the boat just to strengthen the hull. And now I know why. The cracking was really happening on the outside. Um, and I never went deep enough in 2002. I should have went all the way down to this level. This nose is almost ready for replacement. If I wanted to, I could cut this out like a boat that had been damaged in a collision. That's what they would do. They would cut that out, back it from the inside with cardboard and wax paper and literally rebuild the nose. And so I'm going to the port now where the glass, the woven roving and the glass resin are not chipping. That chipped forever and it's not chipping anymore. So what I'm gonna do is go in with, I'll go in with my first couple layers of replacement uh, fiberglass top strand, it'll be the, the, the mat. And I'll just start filling the, I'll do a full piece and well, maybe three full pieces. And then you fill on top of that one piece. So the one piece always is the long, it's the widest 
So it has a lot of grip from the outside and then you build to the inside with smaller, progressively smaller pieces. And then I'll rebuild this nose using epoxy resin, uh, chop mat and um, epoxy filler with chop mat in it. You can buy that just to get the voids filled. And then over here, I literally have a pit uh, tunnel and I will fill that with um, the resin and filler mix just to fill the voids. And all along the rail, I have the same problem. I'm gonna to have to do that as well. So that'll be the next step. So now I'm ready to put a liquefied version of fiberglass and resin into those areas that I know to be hollow um, behind the shear line where the deck and the hull meet. I'm finding space. Um, I'm finding good glass on the surface that I'll be able to paint on, but I'm finding space between the uh, shear clamp the deck and then an inner layer of glass that I had put in for reinforcement years ago. So I want to make sure I have that full of a good resin fiberglass mix that will give it stability and, and you know, if something ever hit that, it could break through. So I want to make it more solid. And that's just a, an issue of an original shear clamp that was not the best. Um, me adding a straighter version, but still not getting um, the, the best version of what I wanted. So I'm going to go ahead and, and fill it with a fiberglass resin mix. And to do that, I ordered a, a quart of the Total Boat um, milled fibers, West System. Um, I'm sure they have something similar. So I thought I'd try this. I'm always eager to see what new things are out there. So what this will be is an additive to my resin for pumps of activator and 105 right now just to get a start and I'll put my mask on when I do that and then I will put it into a plastic bag like a cake icing uh, setup and then just squeeze it I'll cut a little corner out of that bag and just slowly press it into the areas that I want to fill and then I'll look for squeeze out I put different holes in that area so I know that it's getting in there and then coming out it's a way to see that it's full. Um, it's about the only way I know way to do it. And then uh, once I get that done, I will then mix up another batch and start ferring in that, um, that nose that I've taken apart. So while the, the bag trick worked, like frosting, um, I just want to have enough control to be comfortable with it. I think part of it is technique and uh, experience. But what I'm going to do is use my tried and true um, rubber spatula or silicone spatula technique. I've done this a lot where I fill, uh, especially with thicker, thicker stuff. I just keep filling it till I see it full. I just have more control, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and um, you know, with these silicon spatulas, you can get them at their cooking apparatus. So you just get them, and then I can squeeze it in there, and I can control it a lot better. I can even get it down in the groove. I can wipe up. And then I can keep a better, neater job. So I'm just going to go ahead with that. I've got all my resin and milled fibers now injected into the gap that I had in my spray or rub rail or shear line and now because it was dripping a bit because I filled it pretty full I went ahead and put painter's tape on to act as kind of a dam um, to keep it from oozing out until it hardened and it's sitting in there kind of like on a shelf and it's hardening up and then I'll go in there and I'll um, I'll put in more filler a thickened version of that that won't go into the syringe and then um, I'll be able to build it up. So it'll be even full, even more full with fiber. I'll probably even put pieces of chop strand in there, uh, make kind of a slurry and do that too. So next project is to move on to rebuilding the bow. The next step is for me to start making um, pieces to build up these areas that I have scalloped out with different tools. 
uh, this round one, I've got a narrow one here, and then I've got the uh, more of a diffed. I've got a diffed one here that will also be addressed. So what I'm going to do is I take uh, take clear plastic. I, this is just some of the extra five mil I have, and what I'm going to do is you, you know it's, it's glue, so it's kind of sticking on there. What I do is I make a pattern or a circle that goes to the outside of the pattern that I've cut already. And what I'm gonna do is I'll start out big and then I'll start making my pieces of chopped strand smaller on each one. So the first one goes in and it, it connects to all of the outside, giving it a good base. And then I build up slowly um, from the middle. The dish will be there until the last little round spot goes in there. And then I'll, I'll have it, you know, pretty close to fair. And then I'll go ahead and I'll, I have a piece of, um, you see here, cloth. I have a piece of cloth that I will use to cover this whole area so that I can mimic what's going on next to the to these scalloped areas. It'll be cloth again. So, so my second one is just very small. I'm gonna go ahead and, you know, you just put your finger there or tape and you just, you make an outline of where the cloth starts and the hole begins. And I will then use that as my pattern. And then on the last one, it's, it's a larger space. And you know, the plastic just has to be approximate. You're just using it. And you can see through to where you need to be. And then I go ahead and I make, make my patterns. And I'm not sure how many I'll need. I'll probably start out with four for each hole or scallop, and then I'll go from there. Four is your limit anyways, because if you put any more than four layers and you're using epoxy, it gets hot. So it's plus you're really kind of getting to the end of where it'll stay in place. It gets too heavy and it'll sag. So four is your limit on cloth, you're, and then you'll roll it, try to get as much resin out to keep the heat down. And before I do that, I'll also put in a the mixture, the uh, fill of the you know the milled fiberglass and the resin, like I use to inject into the the gaps. I put that on there first to help fill in the divots or the the smaller holes, and it will give that first piece of mat a really good base. It's almost like glass connecting to glass, but in a, in a liquid form, and that'll really help me get a good stick. It'll fill in the little voids that I don't want to go any farther with. Um, and then you know, and the other layers of chopped strand will have just clear straight a, a resin, and then I'll you know saturate them over on my bench. Um, so it'll be like a four piece stick on, and then I'll go ahead and roll it out, get the resin out, because that's what I'm always after, is getting as much resin as you can out of the cloth. And then we'll go ahead and um, we'll see where we are tomorrow. I'll let that harden up and then I'll give it a little brush tomorrow with acetone and a sander because epoxy has what they call a blush. It helps the epoxy cure with air. So it has to put a piece, it has to put something over the epoxy chemical for it to, to cure properly. So the blush, you just take it off with soap and water, literally, if you want. Um, I'll use acetone. And then I'll go ahead and I'll do whatever I think is necessary in um, extra strand. And then... So I'm ready to cut my patterns now. And there's there's a couple ways you can do this. You have a pattern and you have the cloth, or the, or sorry, the mat. You can buy these really handy automatic shears. They're battery operated, they last forever. Um, I love these, especially when you're using chop um thing is with with the, the patch that we're making i'm gonna want it to look like this where it's frayed so i'll be probably tearing it from the the, the larger piece so i get that feathered look um, if you're doing larger patches or something you can like i said these clippers are beautiful and i got these they're called easy cutters I'll put a link in the description um, at the end of the video. Um, they're not very expensive. Um, 
I find them really handy when you're doing bigger pieces, especially when you're doing like um, stringers and flat pieces that are need to be straight. Uh, so, and you can also use scissors. A lot of people have a dedicated pair of really nice shears that they use for fiberglass. Um, I just find it's a whole lot easier to use these and it's a lot sharper and making it easy is kind of what you have to go for. So this is what you do. You're trying to find the patch that fits. So, you know, we've got this little guy. So I'm gonna go in there and here's my, you know, my first one. I'm just gonna go ahead and you can see it's got, it's the right size, but it's also got some, some hairs sticking out. So that'll be number one. And then you wanna take about an eighth of an inch on every, every little one that goes, so I'm gonna do four. So I'm just gonna take an eighth of an inch off the end of that. And I have my new patch size. So I go in there and I find one and I just keep tearing. So there's number two. You know, and it'll be obvious because they're getting smaller. So you won't have to number them. Some people will, but um, that glass, if you write on it, that will um, transfer or it'll start to blur when you get it wet. So it's important that you, you know, you're gonna probably paint it anyways. So, so here's my other one. So I'm gonna tear that. Again, I'm okay with hairs sticking out. And then my last one, you know, I've got all my little circles now. But this helps you get your um, patterns ready to go before you go uh, over to the job. And that's what you want. You don't want to have to do any more than you have to. Um, and there's number four. So there's that one patch. Let me throw my circles away. And I can, I'm going to keep doing this for patch number two and, and patch number three. And then when I get ready, when everything's ready, I will then wet down all of them so that I will walk over with this piece of plastic with my three patterns all cut out, all resined up and ready to be stuck on. And then, you know, you can have some tape around in case it starts to sag. And um, that's okay, because you need to keep it in place and it won't take long for it to set up, but you might have to have something there to kind of, you know, for it to hang on. So I'll, uh, I'll get the, these other two ready and then we can start the glue up. So now we're ready to wet up our three patches, uh, pre-impregnate them with the uh, ready-to-go resin, and then we'll just put the patch right on the spot that will have been pre-gooped with the resin that's left, and I'll put some uh, chopped fiberglass, milled fiberglass in there to help fill in those voids, give you a sticky surface, and then I'll press it on there and because they're so small, they shouldn't sag. So this is how I do it. You can um, usually start with the bottom because that's going to be your widest one going on. So these are so tiny that you can just probably put a little resin on them. And what you want to do, uh, matte is really hard to work with with a chip brush. It's going to start pulling these fibers. So you want to get it wet. Some people will even, they'll get the you can get the plastic wet that's a good one remember you're gonna pull this off it's gonna be saturated it's gonna come off everything's gonna be ready to go um, so you can see that I'm trying to get the air out of it and do it now and then Matt will start to get really uh, weird and start to break apart on you but that's good we're gonna be able to peel that up with a like a you know a uh, putty knife really easily. So then you get your other, get your second piece, which is a little bit smaller. You put it on there and then rinse and wash and repeat again. Again, you're trying to get it, getting these all wet. You're going to have a chance to do this on the boat too. So, and I bring in my third. This is where it really gets weird because you're getting so small that your patch is largely just threads. 
Um, so you just, you have to just get in there and, you know, be careful as you can. You can always kind of pull to the sides. And that way it'll lay down, but you want to make sure you get enough resin so it's soaked and then we'll squeeze the rust out with a brush. And then um, you just keep doing that with all three of them. And then we'll take it over to the boat. I have the peanut butter consistency milled fiberglass and resin mixed up and we're gonna do the main spot. And like I said, this, this layer is to help fill in those voids that I was not able to fill in uh, with the injected resin fill. So we're trying to fill the voids that are too small to cover with glass and mat, but also too big almost to do with the, um, the injection that I had. So I'm gonna cover the whole area right up to the cloth where this second patch comes in. I'm gonna get all that, because our patch is designed to go beyond the hole. And I have scalloped out this, you know, like almost like an eight to one ratio, the hole, and you gotta come out quite a bit. Because you wanna make that a gradual um, transition. You don't want it to be just an abrupt, uh, sharp angle. So I'm getting all this covered in. And then when I go to press my fiberglass mat in, uh, not only will it have a great peanut butter consistency glue to adhere to, but I filled in all of those little holes that I, I couldn't go any farther with the sander because I would just, I wouldn't know where to stop. So, so that's ready to go. I then take my little, this would be the second to largest patch. And remember the bottom one is the big one. So I've got this patch pre-saturated and I put it right over the spot. And then I get my brush again and you can just, you kind of pull it. The goal is to get those fibers to become one with the boat. There, you know, there's going to be more grinding, obviously, to come. But as you can see, I'm feathering it out and getting that nice and smooth. And the peanut butter consistency on this brush really is helping. I was able to get all the air out when I did it on the, on the workbench, so it was saturated. And you can look at it and try to find, kind of start in the middle and push out. There's a little bit, I can see a little bit of resin as I'm pushing it out. That's good. You want to remember, you want to make sure that the mat, you know, you're looking for 50 to 50. And when I did my fill, I mean, it was, it was by volume, it was the same volume as the resin. So I know that I've got a pretty good mix underneath and I'm just pushing the air bubbles out. There's one right there. I can see it pushing it out. And you know, just feather that resin out into the glass boat. This is all going to get work done, so you're not hurting anything by putting glass out there. So as I look, I'm not finding any holes. I'm not finding any air bubbles, and I've got a nice feather. So that will be the um, the first layer. And like I said, you don't want any more than four. It'll get hot, and it'll sag. So this is a good number to use. So what I'll go ahead and now is do the small one in this wider scalloped uh, in the same way, and then we'll let that cook overnight. And then um, tomorrow I'll come in with my pattern, and I know that I've got quite a bit to add to this front, and I'll just keep going. <music> got the nose sanded down and I decided not to add another 
or a layer of cloth. Um, this mixture of matte and chopped milled fibers and uh, resin is, in my opinion, very smooth. And I'm not gonna get a better surface if I even put cloth on here. I um, blended these in. You can see the areas, I blended them. The white is the per was uh, the first coat and then the black, so I know that I've reached um, a good surface when I see the white. The area that was originally for the repair is all very clear, it's transparent. But I still have some holes, or I should say pits. So I, you know, I look at my, I have my template, and then I mark the areas that I know need a little bit. Not worth putting the time of resin and chopped mat in here. I just, I'd be buzzing it off. It's time for filler. So then I did my side profile, found that it's very close, and I'm okay with that. So the areas in black are the areas that I've identified as needing filler. And what I'm gonna do is use my, well, total fare. I've got it all mixed up, ready to go. And I'm gonna use a more of a spatula, because you're gonna to want to get I'm going to want to get a, a broad surface when I peel this or uh, smooth this on. You don't want a small little plate, you know, putty knife where it just gets that and maybe you've got an indentation around it. This will allow me to smear it on like butter and fold it a little bit and I can get that curvature that I'm after and it should fill in the spots. It'll also fill in, the, I even found a few little air holes like right there. I didn't get all the air out of that chopped mat. Uh, layer, so I need to get, um, you know, I can pop them right out. Those have to be taken care of with the filler, uh, or you're going to have the same, I'm going to have the same problem that I had before. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, get those out of there, and then we'll go ahead and smooth on the, uh, the fairing compound. So I got all the little air holes opened up and popped them, got the debris out of them, got the acetone, I'm going to want to prep the whole surface. I'm using. You see, it's taking off the marker. It's just working. And then uh, it's been sanded with 80 grit, so it should have some teeth. Now it's been acetone applied so that it'll clean and the dust pulled out with a vacuum. And I just take my spatula. Well, I'm getting a good amount out of there. And I'm just going to start pulling. You know, and following that curve of my really cool bow, and I'm just gonna, you know, scrape it around. I'm gonna fill in some areas between the deck and the hole joint. You can see the green is picking up the little areas. You know, and I'm gonna probably wanna make sure I leave more on and take off. Yes, it is difficult to sand off, especially because I'll be using a hand sander on this this step. You can see it filled in that bow area that I'm working on. Start at the top here. I know those areas are low. I'm going to follow that deck line because I know that needs some filler in there. Just kind of fill it in. This side, thankfully, didn't need a lot of work. So I'm really happy with how that turned out. And uh, I'll probably leave a little extra in this nose just because if I'm not getting a good curve, you know, as much as I'm bending this, oh, that came out really nice. I um, You can always take it down, and I'll use my hand sander looking left and right constantly so that that boat is symmetrical when I look dead on. I want that boat to look perfect flowing away on both sides. I think I need it a little down there if I remember right too. Put a little in there. Again, I can always take it off. I just want to try to get as much in there as I can and get the job done so that I can move on. So I'm going to let that dry. I'm going to work my way around the shear, uh, the hull and deck joint, and there's a, a few spots that need fairing compound as well, and get this whole deck and uh, De deck and um, hull connection fared in and complete. I've completed the first sanding of the first application of Total Fair 
fairing compound and um, I'll now go around the boat and fair out that shear deck hull uh, connection and go back over it again after I hit it with acetone and fill in just a little marks. I'm really happy that I only have just a little bit to do to get this nose totally um, back together. So thank you for joining me again this week and please remember to hit the subscribe button and the like button if you enjoyed the video and please leave any comments that you might have or questions. I always love to interact with others with the same similar problems or aspirations. So um, I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.